Welcome to a special impromptu episode of Movie Geeks United. We're recording this uh, roundtable discussion tonight on Monday, August 20th, 2012, less than 24 hours ago. Uh, there was a news report that uh, Tony Scott, one of the most successful directors in Hollywood, uh, took his own life by jumping off the Vincent Thomas suspension bridge in San Pedro, California. Uh, more news has been coming out throughout the day. Uh, at first, it was reported that uh, he might have had an inoperable brain tumor, which might have given some semblance of a of a motivation for his suicide. Uh, but now his family denies that. Um, but we're not here to necessarily talk about uh, his death. We're here to celebrate his body of work. And to do that, uh, I am joined by Jerry and Aaron and our good friend Rick. So... The first thing I want to know from all of you guys is when you look at his body of work, what are your favorite films? Which ones mean the most to you guys? And I guess, Rick, you can start out by telling me your answer. Yeah, you know, I I really enjoyed a lot of his films a lot. I mean, I just growing up, I mean, I, I, I of course, like Top Gun. It's a fun movie. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a male testosterone movie, and, you know, it's colorful and fast and loud. And, you know, it was, it was, I was a kid. That was fun. I enjoyed Beverly Hills Cop Two. I, I thought that was a you know a stylish film. Um, I I loved Crimson Tide. I thought that was just a fun edge of your seat movie. Uh, I I mean you know, all, all the way up to Unstoppable. You know, and I I really liked Unstoppable a lot. And I you know I saw that with with Jamie and I you know that even the night we saw it, I was like, wow, that's so good. You know, and I was so excited. For his next film, um, I mean, he's, I mean, know, yeah, he's, he's made a lot of, you know, I, I enjoyed Enemy of the State, you know, uh, he's, he's made so many good movies, I, I, I feel like in a lot of respect, like you guys, I'm, I'm still in, I'm still in shock, I mean, he was definitely, I'm sure I'll say it repeatedly, he's definitely, you know, one of my favorites growing up, so. Yeah. Aaron, what, what are your favorites among his work? Um, his peak was the back-to-back. -back of uh, True Romance and Crimson Tide, 93 and 95. He was really firing on all cylinders. And uh, obviously every every time you read one of these stories, it says Top Gun director Tony Scott. That's obviously his most successful film, the most lasting of all those films. And it's a fun movie, but to me, you know, his 80s stuff, which is only three movies, is not the stuff I return to. Uh, in the 90s, he really... You know, he, he just you know he was a director I felt who did, even though he always worked in disreputable genres, you know, cop buddy movies or just buddy movies or just you know, underground you know, gangster world movies, dark you know R R rated movies. I thought he got better. You know, he took all this disreputable subject matter. You know, the stuff that so let's face it, none of this stuff was going to get nominated for Oscars. You know. <laughs> yeah. um, and but he put a he put a high gloss on it, obviously, but he, he just because it wasn't you know reputable stuff didn't mean it had to be bad or be talked down to. And starting with the Last Boy Scout, um, you know, with a screenplay by Shane Black, I think Scott kind of he turned his back on some of that '80s excess and kind of started he did a satire of it with Last Boy Scout, and he said, you know, I'm gonna you know if I'm gonna do this over the top stuff. I'm going to do it the way I want to see it. And so you get true romance, you get a crimson tide. And then in the, you know, in the arts, you know, this last decade, I mean, he was doing experimental stuff that mm. visually that, you know, you wouldn't expect from a guy in his 60s. Everyone's talking, you know, all summer we've been hearing about how freaking with Killer Joe, you know, he's like 77 and people are saying, you know, this is a young, you know, this has the feel of a, First timer or a young director's movie, but Scott was doing stuff visually in Men on Fire uh, and Domino that you know guys in their 60s weren't doing. And I wasn't particularly a fan of Men on Fire and Domino. I thought there the visuals overwhelmed the stories, but I thought uh, I actually thought he was really starting to hone in on that stuff. Deja Vu has a tricky script that's kind of fun and B movie-ish and gritty. Has a terrific car chase. And then really his last two movies, he was really kind of, he was really toning it down. He was still doing his little, you know, his little, you know, like, Jamie, I know you don't like his little subtitles on everything. 
uh, but he was really, I mean, obviously, if you look at Pelham, it's nothing like Man on Fire or Domino, and he's really toning it down, and he's really letting the story and the visuals balance out, and Pelham and Unstoppable uh, are really kind of spectacular, almost old-fashioned movies. I mean, there's a lot of practical visuals in there that, you know, we, we, it was kind of a no, Unstoppable is kind of a no-fat action movie. That's Very kind of, much. Yeah. yeah, that's. I think that's the most efficient, effective movie he's uh, uh, he's ever done, mm-hmm. and that was that, that was exactly what I thought when I walked out of Unstoppable with you, Rick. I mean, I was like, that is one, uh, a, f- a lean movie. I mean, that goes in there. It 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 doesn't even have a second act really. I mean, they they, they the the train starts to starts to get out of control and it's running away from them they catch the train they try to catch the train that that's the movie and it's just it's so expertly done uh i I thought it stood among his his very best like the most enjoyable of any of his works um so jerry what 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 are you i know true romance has to be it would be up there but i would have to say the first i mean i'm a i'm a fan of the hunger i won't lie Mm -hmm. to you i think the hunger still remains one of david bow one of david bowie's really truly great um performances but no on um, the last boy scout um first and foremost um it's everything that the last action hero tried to be but it i think everything it's like it's a it's a vicious satire of the whole genre because it's just so over the top just so outrageous but it also works um i was always hoping they'd make a sequel to that um because i thought that was definitely one of bruce willis's um best characters obviously true romance um, I'd like to talk about Unstoppable because if that's that's obviously the last film, I mean that's an incredible film. Um, mm-hmm. and it's also he, you know we talk about all these partnerships. What about the Tony Scott Denzel Washington partnership? That was that, that was a ge- rich yeah. Partnership. That was um, gearing up to be like the Scorsese De Niro. I mean yeah, that was like another yeah. great director actor partnership. And I Absolutely. do love. I think of those. I think Man on Fire or Unstoppable. Are my favorites. I, I think Man on, Man on Fire is a very underrated film. Mm. Um, it's a very challenging film. It's got a great supporting cast too. Um, I think Domino, for he he's really trying to outdo Tarantino, and among other things in that film, and it doesn't always work, but it is a lot of fun. Um, it, it's nice to see Mickey work. Obviously, it's great to see Keira Knightley really playing against type. Um, that's a, that's a lot of fun too. I mean, I, I think the only film I'm not really crazy about is The Fan. At the end of the day, I think is the only one I'm not, uh, uh, you know, wild about. Um, but he made. Let's say when you were going to see a Tony Scott film, nine times out of ten you were going to be entertained. Oh yeah. It was very rare that you were going to be disappointed. There's also another thing I was thinking about this today. Well, Ridley's work did not seep into his. It is amazing that there are some pictures that Ridley Scott did that you say, hey, this could be, a, this is like Tony's influenced him. Um, Body of Lies, Black Rain to a lesser extent. Yeah, Jane, yeah, Jane is a total Tony Scott film. I mean, yeah. it's amazing that how, it, how really Ridley was more influenced by him than the other way around. Um, because you do see that um, at times throughout Ridley's career. Wow, you know, these are, so you would think, wow, this is more like a Tony Scott film than a Ridley Scott movie. Yeah. Well, my thoughts on Tony Scott, uh, I mean, I, I do have a couple of that I consider definite favorites. Mm-hmm. Uh, An Unstoppable is one, True Romance, mm-hmm. and then uh, Crimson Tide is definitely the other. Uh, and then the other films that populate his, his career... Um, but I, I I enjoy the vast majority of them, but mm-hmm. to a, to a lesser extent than those top three right. for me. But what strikes me about his style, because when you talk Tony Scott, the first thing that comes to mind is that visual style. It's very distinctive. Um, is as he got older, and Aaron was kind of speaking to this with Man on Fire and and the movies around this period to the end of his life. Uh, he got. He became more of an avant-garde filmmaker, but he, he, the the level of visual experimentation in his movies was incredibly brave. Mm-hmm. And sometimes I thought, as as I did it with Man on Fire, that it tended to derail 
the movie uh, by by just the nature of calling attention to itself or feeling unnecessary at times. But even though I thought that, I I always admired his bravery to to push it as far as he possibly could. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and for a mainstream filmmaker, for a filmmaker that has a lot of money on the line, he wants to get the butts in the seats for the opening weekend. Uh, for for him to have that sense of experimentation is something very rare. Um, and I do think that Denzel provided some of his best work in, in under Tony Scott's direction. Denzel, and it's, it's, it's funny, you know, it, was, it was like a, almost a nine-year gap between Crimson Tide and Man on Fire. Uh, and Crimson Tide is one of those key Denzel ninety, you know, Denzel in the nineties performances where, you know, obviously it's a co-lead which can happen, but Denzel is the lead in that movie, and it was one of the, you know, it was a, it was a post Spike Lee uh, performance, and it's one of his most probably one of his best of that decade, and and then when he starts off in and on fire, you know, Denzel's just coming off of a training day and of course uh, everyone talked about how he played a villain bad guy but here you know i will say i think in man on fire there were problems i have with it what's interesting about man on fire is that denzel's playing a far more complex yes. character than in training day mm-hmm. well it's really the in-between it's the right. in-between between the the very noble denzel that we're used to and the training day it's that it's that gray area in between that that he's playing in man on fire yeah and that is one of the things and and then as he got on, as he got on with the other, with the other uh, uh, Tony Scott Denzel film, I mean, uh, the thing about uh, Unstoppable, the last one, that's Denzel, you know, now Denzel's in his fifties, and he's by that point when you look at him in that, I mean, and he, you see him running on the train and all that, I mean, I mean, it's it's like an old fashioned, it's like what we used to feel when we would see Harrison Ford in The Fugitive. I think we were all looking forward to. Obviously, you know, they probably were going to work again and him being a little older and both of those guys doing it together. I think that's what what was going to be kind of exciting about Top Gun 2 was Tony Scott, you know, who basically made Tom Cruise an international star, returning to what, you know, what they did together, what they started together, putting, obviously, Tom Cruise in the, probably in the Tom Scare type of position. That, That was going to be, whether the film was good or bad, that dynamic was going to be exciting to see. I think I so do. too. And you know, the, the the Top Gun two. I mean, he was going to do it, uh, and and Tom Cruise had shown up for re- to to start rehearsing this weekend, mm-hmm. uh, and so it, it was definitely a project on the horizon. And he was planning to direct another movie before Top Gun two, so he had some some more works lined up for himself. But we are on the subject of his visual flair. And particularly, Man on Fire. Uh, last year, when we did our Art of Cinematography series, we spoke to a cinematographer that uh, Paul Cameron, uh, whose new movie Total Recall is in theaters now. But he shot two movies for Tony Scott. He shot um, Man on Fire and Deja Vu, and he also shot movies for Dominic Senya. And if you think about the look of a Tony Scott film, I don't, I don't think any other director def- defined the look of movies more than he did in the 80s. Uh, because, I mean, he defined definitely the look of all Bruckheimer movies, mm-hmm. th- no matter who directed them. <laughs> yeah, I mean, th- they took Tony Scott's uh, blueprint and they said, make it look like this, you know. But this guy had ha- shot uh, two movies for Tony Scott and he talked a little bit about working with him. So I want to play this clip of his insights. And then working with Tony Scott, it was Tony was much different because we were exploring um, certainly on, on Man on Fire we explored uh, a lot of hand cranked cameras and using reversal film and uh, with a special photographic process. We were developing a style of photography and color that was coming out of um, Denzel's character's psychological state of, of you know, being kind of a uh, depressed alcoholic. Tony Scott's shooting style that he's very unique that he I mean he covers he covers things with a, a lot of cameras does he yeah um it's you know the one thing working with with Tony Scott is you know the very beginning 
um, I could tell right away he wanted to use multi cameras, you know, two, three cameras. You know, then then the next project, three, four cameras, and the next film, you know, five, six cameras, and then suddenly, you know, suddenly cameras just everywhere, and and you know, it's it's kind of um, it's kind of daunting at first because you know you you know you feel like you know how how you know can I concentrate on the shot, you know, or telling the story. Um, and then, you know, in the process of kind of learning his style, letting go, I learned a lot from, from his approach and um, what I what I grew to admire and I've still employed a lot in, you know, later films is, you know, the use of multi-cameras and um, kind of the, the, the freedom of not worrying about exact eye lines and exact matching angles and, and you know, a lot of the things that govern filmmaking uh, in a very traditional way, Tony kind of broke away from. Uh, so it's extremely liberating. Uh, you know, it can be kind of it can kind of be dangerous, and it can feel unfamiliar to a lot of filmmakers. But um, you know, I still I still love getting you know three four angles of almost the same shot at the same time, as long as we can you know we've got the we've got the manpower and cameras to do it. You know, because yeah. you just never you never know. It's like a slight profile shot where you get a glint in the eye or you know, a tear coming out of an eye or something on a on a profile as opposed to a front shot is you know, can have the dynamic to it visually and emotionally that you know, you, that's kind of um, a surprise later. And that's another thing about using all of those multiple cameras, is that usually an actor in a film, like an experienced film actor, and certainly he worked with all the best, many of the best, they generally know, okay, what am I playing to? What lens are you using? What camera? You know, they, they know how to gauge their performance based on that. So when you have a multitude of cameras, really, I mean, that kind of takes that pressure off. And just act, act the scene with your partner, and no matter what, we're going to catch it. You know, <laughs> we've got you covered, uh, and that—that's a unique way of working. All those multiple cameras. I mean, I think he talks about it in the commentary for Unstoppable, and the and the sheer number of cameras he has embedded in that train. Uh, I mean, he's catching everything, which also means that he's got a terribly good editor <laughs> at his but, movies. Not only that, but I mean, let's talk about one thing. Another aspect that I think is pretty important. A lot of these. Uh, Obits that are popping up, considerations of his work by a lot of critics. Some of them are kind of struggling because, you know, like I said, like I think I said, you know, he wasn't out for critical acclaim. But can we just talk about what an amazing director he was of casting? Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I mean, just True Romance and Crimson Tide alone, if you look at the, the you know, I mean, you got the leads, but if you look at the the supporting players, you know, you know, players who only have one scene, two scenes. I mean, they're they're, they're some of their best. And then, Enemy of the State is another one has a lot of uh, key players playing hackers and so forth. Days of Thunder has a lot of people on the pit crew to Pelham and uh, Deja Vu and all that stuff. Spy Game, and the fan, the fan has a. I mean, the fan. You know, people don't. You know, they don't talk about it that much. Um, I look. Like, I always. I describe it as kind of a grindhouse ripoff of Taxi Driver. And um, that basis. That's, that's actually pretty good. That's pretty that good, is, yeah. actually. And and it has an early uh, Benicio del Toro. This. I mean, he 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 doesn't. I don't think he get, one of the things he's not getting credit for is his eye for casting. I mean. Well, and and he, I mean, he made Tom Cruise a. A massive superstar. Yes, he did. He, he, he built he built the biggest superstar we've we've had, mm -hmm. or we, we have today. You know, mm -hmm. and he pretty I, much he gave Christopher Walken and Dennis Hopper yes. second yes. you know final acts in their careers, or at least in Hopper's case, another final a final act. Mm -hmm. With Walken, he pretty much elevated him to the Walken that we know because of True Romance. Mm -hmm. And I think of another movie that he did. That I've always had a soft spot for, and that's revenge. Yeah. Um, uh, I've always loved, I've always liked revenge, and and I think one of the characteristics that pops out most to me about Tony Scott films 
is the macho quality of them. Uh, and so you have Golden Boy Costner uh, going up against and, and getting down and dirty in that movie, and going up against you know Anthony Quinn. I mean, how how more visceral a presence can you get than Anthony Quinn? Right. I mean, he just sticks his chest out, and you're like, oh my god, it's like <laughs> you're imposing as hell. Uh, and I, I I do love that dynamic between the two of them. And he made a movie that he was unapologetic about the movies he made. He knew that he, he, he in a lot of these movies, just like Top Gun, just like Revenge, uh, he he needed to make a, a great, entertaining, sexy, glossy, bloody uh, entertainment. Mm-hmm. And he was he was the best at it. I think one of the best at it. Yeah. And- Revenge is is an interesting film in that it's uh I mean it's essentially a three character piece. Mhm. Mm-hmm. That's probably I mean you really have to go to I guess I mean you have to flash forward all the way to Unstoppable where it's you know Denzel and uh and Chris Pine in the in the train car that is back and forth. Yeah. I mean, he you know and it's oddly, oddly enough you know as massive as Unstoppable is you know those train car scenes are pretty intimate but you know Revenge is just this this love triangle and this kind of very passionate, you know, melodrama. It's it's a it's a Tony Scott version of a of a kind of a of a of a melodrama. That's mm-hmm. his that's his version of what a romantic, violent melodrama would be. That's and, Tarantino's and, favorite. That's one yeah. of Tarantino's favorite movies, right? Yes, it is. I mean, yeah. There's, a, there's a, I heard a, it was on a commentary. I can't remember which one. With Tarantino says, you know. Whenever Tony's like in pre-production, he doesn't take his calls because Tony is the only guy he can't say no to, and he knows Tony's gonna call him to ask him to do rewrites. Because uh, you know he did he did a you know uncredited rewrite on Crimson Tide, uh, you know because obviously he, he loved him what he did for True Romance, so he's like I know when Tony calls he wants me to do a rewrite, so I don't take his calls because I don't like I, I like the money he said I like the money I got for rewriting, but I don't want to do it anymore. <laughs> the, only guy, the only guy I can't say no to, and, and to the point, I mean, Tarantino's script of True Romance, he had you know, you know, Christian Slater dying, and uh, the story goes that when Tony Scott brought Christian Slater back, you know, originally Tarantino was like, no, don't, and the thing he told Tony was, Revenge, man, remember the ending of Revenge? I want, I want, the, I want the ending to Revenge on the movie, mm-hmm. and then when he saw it, he's like, okay, it works, I, I see your point. The other story, I remember when he was, uh, the story I heard when he was in Park City in 92 with Reservoir Dogs, he was kind of alone because he wanted to, you know, everyone there was kind of, you know, uppity about talking about cinema and film. And he's like, man, I couldn't, I heard a, I read a quote, I heard a quote, that said, uh, I couldn't find anyone who wanted to talk about Revenge or Days of Thunder. He's like, those are the cool movies I want to talk about. But no one, no one in Park City was wanting to, to talk about talk about those those types of movies i think about true romance too and there's there's an element of it that it's kind of a a a, a young teenager's version of what would be a really cool uh love story i mean mm-hmm. there's a lot of james dean and elvis presley and all the violence right. and guns and drugs and and the just the coolest girlfriend in the world that stands by you no matter what. It, it, there's this kind of very youthful, sweet exuberance in the movie, uh, surrounded by this like in- incredible violence, <laughs> incredible right. violence. You know? She's a hooker, but she's only had like three clients in four days. Right. She's not <laughs> that bad. She's not. She hasn't been, you know, she hasn't been used that much. So she's still uh, reputable as a human being. You know, and you posted something uh, like a, a defense of of his place in movies and his particular style and voice. Mm-hmm. And the first person that responded was, you know, when he get, when he had a great script, he he made a good movie. But uh, you know, essentially that he wasn't all that. But I mean, my point is, isn't doesn't everybody kind of require a great script to make a great? Yeah, uh, it, it, you, that, know, you do need it. I mean, it is. Is that like an epiphany? You know, you can make a great movie if you got a great script. I mean, nobody says, here's a shitty script. Uh, I'm sure you can make a great movie out of it. 
I mean, it's tr- it brings out the best in anyone. Yeah. 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 And, and that is, and the clearest example of that is my least favorite Tony Scott film is Beverly Hills Cop Two, because um, I mean, it, it it has, I mean, obviously it had a script, right? But I mean, you can literally see where they're like, okay, now we need this scene. Now we need this scene. Mm-hmm. Now now Eddie needs to do this. Eddie needs to do this. Okay, we need a chase. We need a shootout. We need a one-liner. And it's just so paint by numbers. And the fact, and the biggest problem in Beverly Hills Cop 2, just beyond a bad script, is that Eddie, you know, actual Foley, Eddie Murphy, is not in conflict with the establishment. You know, that was the thing about, that was the, the fun about Beverly Hills Cop was, Axel Foley, down and dirty ghetto cop from Detroit, disrupting the Beverly Hills high Out of his element, yeah. Yeah. Now, Beverly Hills Cop 2, he knows his way around. He's got the two Beverly Hills cops on his side. So he's not really up against anything. So Well, at that point, I mean, he had just, I mean, he started, he, he always wanted to be a feature director. And I'm sure he very much looked up to his brother. And he worked a lot in commercials and, and, and music videos, and he did The Hunger, and The Hunger did not do well. No, not even either. though, it, in a lot of circles, it was very well received critically. And that, if you talk about a mood piece, I, I think it's drenched. Oh yeah, <laughs> it, dude. I mean, that's like. <laughs> I mean, that's inc- incredibly like moody. It's like. Uh, yeah, and it's not even about. I mean, that, that movie is not about story. I mean, you you could no. you could tell that's that's about the the visual experience mm-hmm. and what that emits to an audience. But then he was very, you know, he was down, that movie tanked, and it was a couple of years, and I guess Simpson Bruckheimer saw, uh, the saw... They saw The Hunger, but they also saw a commercial he made where I think a race car, like, tries to outrun a jet. Yeah. And they, and they said, we want him for Top Gun. And I think he was very shrewd. He He looked at it, he said... I can make this a big hit. I mean, I know I know why this sells, and I know how to sell it. And so when that became a huge hit, uh, I mean, he's a big commercial director now. He's made one of the biggest smashes ever, started a big phenomenon. And so I think that they thought he's perfect to further cement Eddie Murphy's kind of action hero superstardom. And I do think that Beverly Hills Cop was completely programmed from the beginning to, get, to 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 build Eddie Murphy as a big action star, at the sacrifice of the actual movie, you know, uh, mm-hmm. I think that's probably kind of what you're saying. And he does Day of Thunder, which got which was a rush job and got hyped as Top Gun on you know on wheels, you know, mm-hmm. Top Gun in NASCAR. And you know, the funny thing is, I think oddly enough, critics probably gave Day of Thunder probably a little more praise than. Well, I know they gave a little more praise than the audience did. And and the thing is about Days of Thunder, well, it is pretty much Top Gun Redux. The difference is is that Robert Town is doing the screenplay, so you do have some lines and some nicely etched kind of, you know, B movie style characters. You, you know, Robert Duvall's a character, Michael Michael Rooker's a character, uh, John C. Riley's a character, mm-hmm. Harry Always is a character, Nicole Kidman far and away better than Kelly McGillis in the female role. And that's because, you know, Robert Town is he Robert Town basically, you know, like, look, we're doing Top Gun on wheels, but you can do it. And he knew that no one would do those iconic moments better than he did. Mm-hmm. Uh and when I think of J- Days of Thunder, I mean the first image that pops in my mind is the first time we see Tom Cruise, and he's he's riding his motorcycle through the fo- through the fog, <laughs> through the smoke, on the NASCAR track, and it's I mean that that image knows what it is. I mean that that's built to be an iconic star entrance, and it's one of yeah, the great, great star entrances actually. Mm-hmm. He was great at Plus casting. Duvall you know? talking to the race car. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, I love that. <laughs> He's giving a monologue <laughs> to the race car. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's the best audience he's ever had. People don't know that movie humanized Michael Rooker because he was coming <laughs> off of uh, Sea of Love and Henry Portrait of a Serial Killer. Right. So we we finally got a sympathetic uh, Michael Rooker. Uh, yeah, no small feat there. Yeah, that is yeah. that is quite an accomplishment. That is yeah. a. Uh, that's a <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love Michael Rooker. He's a but, good, he's a good guy. Yes, I, he is. I, what do you think, uh, Rick? What do you think of Spy Game? Um, 
Yeah, I I liked it okay. I mean, I wasn't. I thought it was okay. I mean, um, I I I saw it. I I thought it was interesting. It was kind of. It wasn't one of my favorites. It, it, it's definitely shot like a Tony Scott movie. You know, you can tell he's got multiple cameras. It's interestingly paced, very visual. Mm-hmm. But I, you know, it, it's not one of my favorites. Well, it's like a. I guess it's one of those where he he loved to work with kind of gorgeous movie stars. And so right. Wait, well, he, <laughs> he got two of them, right? Brad Pitt, I know. Robert I know. Redford, yeah. I mean, this this great combo. Uh, but when I think of Spy Game, I think of the story that Redford always told. And I know that I've, I've told you this story before, Rick, but Redford was talking about working with Tony Scott, and he said, I just wanted to know how he shoots movies. I just wanted to be around that because it's that – that method of shooting movies with multiple cameras and all that kind of stuff is completely foreign to me. So he was doing the rooftop scene, and they had cameras everywhere. And they they had a helicopter like flying around them, mm-hmm. and there was a camera mounted on the uh, the helicopter. And, and Redford was just like looking around and thinking, yeah, <laughs> I've never been in something like this before. <laughs> you know, just just like this uh, odd observer of Tony Scott and his method of working. There was a uh, behind enemy lines was like right on top. Yeah, of it. Right yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that, that was now see, right if you look at behind enemy lines. There's a Tony Scott wannabe movie. I mean, that, yeah. yeah, that's a case of a director. Oh, I want to do a Tony Scott movie. And, I mean, yeah. you really, you really do see a lot of want want to be Tony Scott movies and in the action genre. I well, mean, yeah. I, I, I definitely see the influence all over the place. I, I wanted earlier today. I want to play one more clip. Earlier today, I talked to Brian Tyler, but I, I mean, I talked to him for Expendables too because he just scored Expendables too, and that's what he was coming on to promote. But I was, I was, I was talking to him. I looked over his resume, and he provided additional music for Unstoppable. Uh, and so I asked him about Tony Scott, and I wanted to play what he had to say about him because I think it illuminates some ways in which Tony Scott has had an enormous influence and will continue to have a great influence uh, on film. I, uh, before I let you go, I, I, I wanted to ask because, um, I mean, I saw earlier today, uh, I saw that you were you were credited for doing some work on Unstoppable. Did, did you do oh, work yeah. on Unstoppable? I, I, in fact, that's, it's interesting that you noticed that. Yeah, um, this, because you know, um, Tony you know, passed away and... Uh, yeah. It's, it's it's so sad, and and my my contact with him was on Unstoppable, and it it was it was I mean I've been a fan of his you know forever since I was a kid, and uh, when it came to that, um, I don't remember the circumstances exactly, but they there's there's like um, uh, some scenes in there, a big chunk of some I don't know. It was, I think it was like the action sequence at the end and and all that where they wanted to use my music, some music that I'd already written, actually. Mm. Um, and uh, so that ended up happening, and um, it worked great, you know, and, and it worked really well with Harry's music, and um, it just kind of was was a, was a cool thing, a big honor, you know, too, to just be in a Tony Scott film, and it, it was... You know, so then you know it's it's strange, you know, those things, and then you all of a sudden you you get a phone call in, in the morning, like, hey, did you hear? You know, mm. and uh, uh, did just, did you have a chance to to meet him ever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah he's awesome, you know. Um, just a uh, you know an intense friend, intense guy, friendly guy, funny mm. guy, um, like old school real director, you know, super talented. And, Very uh, much, yeah. Yeah, you know. We're paying, you know, we're paying tribute to his films. Um, <clears throat> we're paying tribute to his films tonight, actually, oh, and, 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 and thinking about his the music that accompanied his films. I mean, oh. I think just in terms of the, the, the modern action film as we know it today, he had a major role in defining it. Yeah. Uh, but also musically. I mean, the, 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 the musical uh, voice to the action genre he 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 had a major role in that as well, I think. Huge, huge. 
Totally, not to be underestimated, you know. And I mean, and, and it started off very interestingly too. I think it was, it was the hunger was first, right? Or so, um, yes. And yes. and then you know to go into doing things like you know obviously Top Gun, and then then the then moving into the the whole milieu that that, that he, all the films he worked on with Harry and, and, and Hans and and uh, it's such a like yeah it defines kind of the modern action vibe and um, uh, he was so good at kind of I think encouraging composers to do a certain something you know that mm-hmm. that always seemed to capture the vibe of the movie and. Um, and, and it's funny because it, it is so true that you associate this, these, this type of music and the sound with his movies. And at, at the same time, the guy was pegged early on, just like his brother, as being a pure visual guy. You know, coming from cinematography and coming from doing you know commercials and things like that. That that the knock on him was that he was just he it, it was so the stuff was so pretty that he shot it just looked unbelievably cool. You know, mm-hmm. it, but it 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 really lent itself to great music because these visuals opened up enough space that it wasn't just you know uh, it opened enough space that you, it wasn't just explosions this stuff looked right it almost looked like it, it it kind of fooled you into thinking wow this is like this eye candy special effects film when you look at it it was just the way he'd like he'd pick his lens and and light a scene and like that was his special that was his greatest special effect was his eye and so you know, you were able to do music without tons of sound effects going on all the time. I mean, there were those scenes, of course. <laughs> but, um, and, and so you had those moments where you could, like, you all of a sudden hear, you know, and, and it's like these shots, these long shots, these long lens shots with the beautiful amber, sunny hue, and, and like, you know, um, it left room for really cool music and, and, and um, it's an indelible and, mark. I, it's so iconic, and I think about—I mean, you do think about big action films and Tony Scott, and, and, but you think you, you look at Crimson Tide, and you think of that as a big action film, but yeah. it's two two great actors in a submarine going. Submarine, I know. The the unstoppable, w- two two guys on a train. Yeah, you know, uh, incredible. Same guy, Denzel, and both. Um, yeah, I mean, and and the score is so cool for um, Crimson Tide, you know, and. It, that, that kind of, in a way, uh, was a turning point. Also, like the, what we know as kind of this era of, um, you know, motif-driven scores with mm-hmm. that kind of sound it was really. It was kind of the one that popularized it to me, at least. I think uh, so it was too. Crimson Tide. Yeah. You know, uh, yeah. and then and then all the way through, you know, actually like Deja Vu, just and and all, you know, with kind of refining it through the years and. Um, and again, he kind of always worked on his craft. It was uh, just, you know, I mean, the guy was, uh, you know, he, he, was, he was something else. So that's Brian Tyler. His full interview will air next week, but I wanted to <clears throat> play that clip of him talking about uh, Tony Scott. I, I think I show. said, you know, Facebook, Jamie, I think you saw, or, I mean, I think Hans Zimmer's scores for True Romance and Crimson Tide, I mean, those are career highlights. For me. Yes. Yes. Um, I mean, they're just. Well, yeah. It, yeah. So. Even the orchestral score on like Days of Thunder is really good too, and you know. I, yes. The. I, I, yeah, I, I think you know Aaron brought up earlier that he was good at casting, and realistically, he was really good at you know finding composers that that really went along with his films too. So. And he was he had people that were very loyal to him. I mean, I think, I think he had a core crew. That always yeah, kind of relished relish the idea of working with him, and you see it in the actors too. I mean, he used the same actors multiple times, and mm-hmm. so it really felt like kind of a repertoire, a repertory of mm-hmm. of uh, collaborators that he had in his pocket. Um, yeah, they kind of he kind of referred to them as like his second family. Yeah, true. But yeah, very true. The, uh, I think the DP uh, on Unstoppable started off as like. The assistant or the, the the slate clapper, like yeah. 22 years yeah. ago. I mean, and, um, yeah. No, you don't. I mean, I I haven't heard any. I, I'm sure there are, but I mean, as jocular and as testosterone filled, some of his sets were obvious. Obviously, were. I mean, it's funny. I mean, I haven't he, haven't heard a story yet of no. like, where oh I didn't get along with him. No. Yeah. You know. 
Ridley's yeah. had problems with actors, you know, probably <laughs> more yeah. than Tony. You know, and, and actually, many of his actresses came out today and talked about, this is the sweetest man I've ever worked for. Yeah. I mean, something else came, comes to mind, too, when we're talking about the directors that owe a lot to Tony Scott's style uh, and, and are desperate to make Tony Scott films and can't. Uh, I, I would put Michael Bay in that category. Actually, <laughs> yeah, they they, they 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 get the surface, they duplicate the surface, but no one wants to acknowledge that Tony Scott had a genius for streamlining streamlining stories. I want to bring up I want to bring up two things in closing. Yep. Uh, and one of them has to do with racism. <laughs> oh God! Oddly, here we go. Oddly enough. Because, I, I mean, I posted that uh, Crimson Tide, I mean, that's it, probably my favorite Tony Scott film. I mean, I, th I, 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 I that and Unstoppable. But And, and uh, my good friend said they really took out all the, all the racism that was in that script. And my thought on that was, I'm so glad that they did. Be because for me, Crimson Tide works because these two actors are going head to head. You know, in real life, these two actors have a tremendous respect for each other. Mm -hmm. And you have a feeling, a sense, that even though they are at odds and they, and they disagree fundamentally about their mission and what it should be, that they have a respect for each other as characters. And I think the moment you put race into that, it automatically weakens one of those characters. True. Uh, well, you know, would, they, they, would... they, they see each other on, on terms of... Uh, on kind of equal terms, right? I I would say that you, you know you don't you don't have to put racism in the script uh, or racial element in the script. Let's just say you don't have to put put a racial element into the script. Let's not call it racism, just a racial element into the script, because the fact that you have a white superior officer and a black uh, subordinate, okay. Already there, it's, it's already there. So you don't have to announce what's already there. And yes, they are. Uh, they are two characters. Uh, those yes, two characters. Yes, but we're ta we're talking about a filmmaker that people criticize for being too excessive. And right. then when I bring up Crimson Tide, which I think is his best movie, they yeah. criticize him for not being obvious enough. So uh, that's that's my point. I yeah, think that yeah, no, I think that it only it only strengthens that movie. Possibly that undercurrent is there. I think that's probably something that the audience brings to it. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, but I think it's it only benefits the movie not to have that explicitly expressed. Actually, the weakest part of the movie to me is when it is expressed in that horse back and forth exchange that Tarantino wrote for it. That's the thing, though. Tony Scott in his films, when it, whenever he's done these black and white characters, be it Last Boy Scout, be it uh, Crimson Tide, uh, be it The Fan, and uh, be it Unstoppable. People talk about his excess, and the thing that's excessive is is I don't I don't consider it mostly excessive because he's usually telling stories that involve characters under duress in extreme situations. Yeah, so yeah. to be restrained uh, would just be kind of counterproductive, but therefore, but also when you're dealing with uh, with extreme situations, you don't have time to parse out, uh, you know, you know, racial animosity. It's, it's front, and, <laughs> you know, it's front. And, it doesn't mean. But but I could look. I can easily see yeah. any other director. Uh, and I'm not saying that all directors would do this, but I can easily see a lot of directors going in and playing that up. But the second Gene Hackman would express something like that, he he would lose major ground. It would not be the Clash of the Titans that that movie is right now. I mean, the, he would lose moral footing. And and what makes that movie so powerful is that you you understand where they where they stand and and you sympathize completely with both points of view. And uh, another, the last thing that I want to say um, about Tony Scott is there's going to be a lot of, and we're already seeing it, uh, there's going to be a lot of intellectual snobism about Tony Scott. <laughs> but uh, what makes Tony Scott unique and what all movies could use more of, including the artistes with a capital A, mm -hmm. is a sense of energy, a sense of momentum, a sense of, my God, I'm making a movie. 
It's so exciting. Mm-hmm. I love this more than anything in life. At Tony Scott's best, he made bad movies, mediocre movies. He made a few great movies. Throughout, you always got that sense about him. And that's what I think personally I, I will cherish most about mm-hmm. Tony Scott's movies. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree. I would, uh, with that. Yeah, I can. I will. I will happily like you give me a Tony Scott film to watch. Like a choice between a Tony Scott film and a Bell, and the latest Bellatar movie. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm gonna take the Tony Scott film. Oh yeah. I mean, and it doesn't yeah. have. To, it doesn't even have to be True Romance or Crimson Tide. They're like, do you want to see the fan or do you want to see the latest Bellatar? And for all the bombast, uh, he loved actors, and actors loved him. Watch Crimson Tide. Watch Unstoppable. I mean, those are actors. Watch Spy Game, for that matter. Absolutely. Spy Game, a massive kind of uh, canvas that he's working on, Mm -hmm. and it's it's this very, it's this decades-long kind of, at the root, very intimate story between uh, between mentor and protege. I mean, that's the heart of it. All right, guys. I really appreciate you taking part in this. Uh, oh, this is going to air later of, tonight. Gonna, I wish it was under happier circumstances. But well, I think I think that we were happy celebrating his movies and celebrating right. what we thought we uh, what we feel about him. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's Absolutely. that's the celebration.